This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Battle Cry. Battle Cry, the 150th Civil War Anniversary Edition, was released in 2010 by Avalon Hill and designed by Richard Borg. This game supports two players and takes about 45 minutes per scenario to play. Before we begin this episode, I'd like to recognize the Harsh Rules Patreon supporters that help make content like this possible. If you'd like to support the channel, head over to patreon.com slash harsh rules to learn more. And once again, thank you for your support. To begin a game, players select a scenario from the rulebook. Battle Cry the 150th Civil War Anniversary Edition comes with 30 scenarios. In this episode, we're going to learn from the first scenario, First Bull Run, which can be found on page 17. A scenario listing contains the following information. At the top of the page, the scenario will display its setup positions for each player's army and any terrain to include on the battlefield. The Historical Overview section gives a summary of the battle and any additional historical context required. The Staffing Notes section names each player's army, identifies their main leader, establishes each player's starting hand of command cards, and indicates the player that moves first. The Victory section reveals the number of banners required to win the game, and there is a section for special rules unique to that scenario. Now that we understand the layout for a scenario, let's set up our first game. Battlecry's game pieces represent various types of military units and their leaders. Each plastic figure in a unit indicates its overall health. A successful hit in combat removes a figure and when the last figure is removed, which is the flag bearer, the unit is defeated and the player earns a flag. Flags count as points to win the scenario. Each player's side of the board has a number of flag stands to keep track of these. Generals are not considered units. They are their own game piece. When a general is attached to a unit, they can provide significant benefits in battle. We will learn more about generals and their abilities later in this episode. Now that we understand the figures a little bit better, let's set up the game. Following the setup diagram, place the terrain hexes on the game board. Next, place the plastic miniatures. The Union Army player will set up their forces on the northern half of the board and the Confederate Army player on the southern half. Keep in mind, only one unit may occupy a hex. Generals, on the other hand, may occupy a hex with a friendly unit. Finally, thoroughly shuffle the command card deck and deal each player the number of command cards allotted by the scenario. These cards become the player's starting hand. Then, make sure the game's battle dice are near the game board, as well as any reference cards you might need, and you're ready to begin playing the game. Now, let's learn more about the sequence of play. In Battle Cry, each player's turn is organized into five phases. In Phase 1, the player selects and plays a command card from their hand. Then, in Phase 2, following the command card's instructions, the player identifies their units that will receive these orders. An ordered unit may move and potentially conduct combat. After that, in Phase 3, the player may move any or none of their ordered units. Be aware though, once this phase ends, the player may not move units again during this turn. In phase 4, the player then declares which of their ordered units will, if they're able to, conduct combat and then resolves all those combat instances. And finally, in phase 5, the player discards their used command card and draws another one from their deck. If the draw deck runs out of cards, shuffle the discards to form a new draw deck. This will end the first player's turn, then the second player takes their turn following these five phases and so on. Players continue to take turns until one of them meets the victory conditions of the scenario and wins the game. Next, let's walk through each of these phases in greater detail. To 
To understand card play, orders, and movement, first it's necessary to learn how the board functions. The Battlefield game board is a grid 13 hexes wide by 9 hexes deep. The battlefield is divided into three sections by two dotted lines, giving each player a left flank section, a center section, and a right flank section. Each side issues orders to their units and or leaders by playing command cards from their hand. For example, this command card allows two units to be ordered in the left flank section, this one two in the center section, and this one two on the right flank section. Whenever a dotted line cuts through a hex, that hex is part of both its flank section and the center section. Therefore, units in these split hexes may participate in orders in either section. At the start of a player's turn, they will select one command card from their hand, place it face up in front of them, and read it aloud to their opponent. Next, following the card's instructions, they will announce which eligible units or leaders they choose to order. Only those units or leaders chosen to receive an order may move, battle, or take a special action. A leader in the same hex as a friendly unit is considered to be attached to that unit. If that unit is ordered to move, the attached leader must move with the unit. An attached leader must move to the same hex as the unit. Please note that it only costs one command to order a unit with an attached leader. Also be aware that a player may not give more than one order to each unit or leader. If the command card allows a player to issue more orders in a given section of the battlefield than they have units or leaders, those additional orders are lost. Command cards can be divided into two types, section cards and tactic cards. Section cards refer to orders that affect a specific number or type of units and leaders in certain sections of the game board, or a combination of units in different sections. Some section cards will allow a player to order units equal to command. Command refers to the number of command cards in the player's hand. As you just saw, most command cards direct orders at specific sections of the game board and or unit types. There are also command cards that utilize leaders. Leadership cards allow you to order a leader, and then cascade that order from that leader to any units attached to them, basically in the same hex, plus a given number of units or leaders in adjacent linked hexes to move and or battle. Units in adjacent linked hexes may be in different sections of the battlefield, as long as each ordered unit is adjacent to at least one other ordered unit, and at least one of the ordered units is adjacent to the designated leader. In this way, a leadership order enables you to chain units to move and or battle in a coordinated fashion. Just be aware though, once a leadership order is issued, that leader may not detach from a unit. The second type of command cards are tactic cards. These cards feature special rules that enable units to move and or battle in unique ways or that create other effects as noted on the text of the card. Tactic cards can allow players to battle twice with specific units, mirror an opponent's command card, replace lost units, and other unique effects which can help turn the tide in a battle. In this phase, players may take the units and leaders they issued orders to and move them. Unit movements are made sequentially. One ordered unit moves at a time, in the sequence of the player's choice. The player must complete one unit's movement before beginning another. In addition, the player must complete all unit movements before proceeding to battle. Another key factor in movement is the ability to conduct combat. An ordered infantry unit may move one hex in any direction and battle. Their firing range is four hexes. Cavalry units may move up to three hexes and battle. However, cavalry do not have ranged weapons and can only battle an enemy in an adjacent hex. Artillery units have the longest range in the game of five hexes. If an artillery unit moves, it may not battle in that turn. 
generals can move up to three hexes and may move through friendly unit spaces. However, since they represent a single person, they cannot conduct combat. Battlecry uses a unified combat system based on range, but it's helpful to think of these as two combat types. All units can conduct close combat. Close combat may occur when opposing units are in hex spaces adjacent to each other. Units equipped with projectile weapons may also engage in ranged combat. Ranged combat may occur when an enemy unit is within the projectile's reach and the attacker has a clear line of sight to the target. Certain terrain types can block line of sight and prevent range combat. After all, a unit must be able to see the enemy unit if it wants to battle. This is known as having line of sight to the enemy. To determine if line of sight exists, imagine a line drawn from the center of the hex containing the battling unit to the center of the hex containing the enemy target. This line of sight is blocked if a hex or part of a hex between the battling unit and the target hex contains an obstruction. Obstructions include a unit or a general, regardless of whether it's a friend or a foe, and some terrain types. The terrain in the target hex does not block line of sight. If the imaginary line runs along the edge of one or more hexes that contain obstructions, Line of sight is not blocked unless the obstructions are on both sides of the line. Next, let's take a look at some restrictions to keep in mind when conducting combat. While conducting combat, it's important to keep in mind the following combat restrictions. First, a unit may never split battle dice between several enemy targets. If a unit is adjacent to one or more enemy units, it may not attack a more distant enemy. And finally, the number of playing pieces in a unit does not have any effect on the number of battle dice rolled. Casualties do not affect the number of battle dice rolled by a unit. If at least one playing piece remains, the unit can battle at full strength. Each unit has its own unique fighting abilities. An infantry unit has the most health of any unit. They have a firing range of four hex spaces and they can attack adjacent enemies with four battle dice. For ranged combat, their battle dice rolled is reduced by one for each hex space of distance. Artillery has the least amount of mobility, but the greatest firing range of five hex spaces. Artillery can attack an adjacent enemy with five battle dice. Similar to infantry, they lose one dice per hex space of distance. Cavalry has the greatest mobility, but poorest range. They can only attack adjacent enemies, but do so with three battle dice. With these statistics in mind, let's now learn how die rolls translate into hits, misses, retreats, and other effects. All battles are resolved with custom six-sided dice. Each side of these battle dice depict a symbol to indicate a specific outcome to the conflict. To score a hit on a unit, the player needs to roll the symbol of that unit. There are two symbols for infantry, one for cavalry, and one for artillery. The, the attacker can also score a hit for each saber rolled, which affects any unit or a lone general. Finally, a flag die result causes a unit to retreat one hex space towards its side of the board. The defending player gets to decide to which hex a unit retreats to. Before we move on, let's cover the rules of retreat. When a unit is retreating, there are maybe situations where it has to pass through terrain. Passable terrain has no effect on retreat moves, but impassable terrain cannot be retreated through. Also, other units cannot be retreated through, whether they're friendly or enemy. There are some exceptions to this. A friendly unattached general will stop a retreating unit and attach to them. Another exception is a retreating general may move through friendly units slash generals, but they cannot attach until their retreat is completed. Next, a retreating unit with attached general may not retreat onto a hex with another friendly general. Attached generals must retreat with their unit, and if the unit is eliminated, the general must complete the retreat. Finally, if a retreat is blocked, which means there's an inability to complete a retreat due to the board edge, impassable terrain, blocking the path, 
will result in one figure elimination for each hex space that could not be completed. And this includes the general figure if it is attached. They would be removed last. Now, let's walk through the procedures for combat. Combat is conducted in six short steps. In the first step, the attacker will check the range and line of sight to the target. If the target is within range and line of sight, this will determine the base number of battle dice to roll. Next, players will determine if any terrain involved will reduce the number of battle dice to be rolled. We'll look at the specific effects of terrain in the first scenario in the next section. In step 3, the attacker rolls the battle dice, and then in step 4, they apply any hits. Once hits are applied and any figures removed, then in step 5, any flag retreat die results are then resolved. Finally, in step 6, if the attacker has an attached general and the defending unit has either retreated or been eliminated, the attacker's units may then take ground and move into the defender's vacated hex space. Next, let's discuss generals. When a general is attached to a unit, it can provide significant benefits. First, embolden troops. When a general is attached, the unit ignores one flag die result. Next, take ground. When attached to an infantry or cavalry unit, if that unit defeats an adjacent enemy or forces them to retreat, the unit and the general may then advance into the defender's vacated hex. An additional note to attach generals. If the unit is eliminated, any extra saber die result does not affect the general. Generals must be eliminated in a subsequent battle. Now let's discuss some rules around lone generals. These are generals that are alone in their own hex space. Either because they have lost their unit, or they have detached from a unit and are moving to a new location on the battlefield. First, a general can only be attacked and hit, which requires one saber die result when alone in a hex space. Therefore, when they move away from a unit, they become vulnerable to attack. Keep in mind though, when attacked, that general may ignore one flag die result. Also remember that lone generals cannot battle. Keep these rules in mind when developing a strategy with generals. This edition of Battlecry comes with a double-sided player reference sheet, which details the effect of terrain. Next, we're going to cover the terrain you'll encounter in the first scenario. First, let's take a look at the woods hex. For movement, a unit or general that enters a woods hex must stop and may move no further that turn. A cavalry or artillery unit may not battle on the turn that it moves onto a woods hex. On the turn that an infantry unit moves onto a woods hex, it may battle an enemy unit that is two or fewer hexes away in any direction. That infantry unit rolls two dice when the target is an adjacent hex, and one die when the target is two hexes away. An ordered unit that started the turn in a woods hex will battle with its standard number of battle dice. When targeting an enemy unit or general that is on a woods hex, reduce the number of battle dice rolled by one. And finally, a wood hex blocks line of sight. Next, let's talk about hill hexes. For hill hexes, there are no movement restrictions. When battling from atop a hill hex, an artillery unit has a maximum range of six hexes. With a six hex range, the artillery unit rolls its normal battle dice for range one to five, and at range of six hexes, they roll one die. When targeting an enemy unit or general that is on a hill hex, reduce the number of battle dice rolled by one. Finally, a hill hex blocks line of sight for a unit trying to look over or through it. A unit on a hill hex, therefore, will not have a line of sight to an enemy unit on another hill hex if there is an intervening hill hex between the two units. Let's discuss the homestead hex. For movement, a unit or general that enters a homestead hex must stop and may move no further that turn. 
When an infantry unit moves onto a homestead hex, they may battle an enemy unit that is three or fewer hexes away in any direction. However, when doing so, the infantry unit rolls three battle dice for an adjacent enemy and one less die for each hex away. In subsequent turns, if they remain on the homestead hex, they battle with their normal number of battle dice. In a similar fashion, a cavalry unit that moves onto a homestead hex rolls two battle dice for an adjacent enemy. If they remain on the homestead hex, in subsequent turns they battle with their normal number of dice. An artillery unit may not battle the turn it moves onto a homestead hex. However, in subsequent turns, when an artillery unit is on a homestead hex, their range is reduced to four hexes and roll four dice to an adjacent enemy and one less die for each additional hex away. When targeting an enemy unit or general that is on a homestead hex, reduce the number of battle dice rolled by one. And finally, a homestead hex does not block line of sight. After completing all movement, battles, and retreats, the active player discards their command card and draws another card from the deck. If the draw deck runs out of cards, shuffle the discards to form a new draw deck. And now, their opponent gets to go through their turn. Following the same process as before, players will continue to alternate back and forth until the scenario's victory conditions are met. And, with everything we've covered in this episode, you should be ready to play the first scenario on your own. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this is Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.